By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I am playing against Joseph, and Joseph is one of the co-founders of Paladin Magic. That is a playgroup, the Northern Paladin playgroup, and they have their very own rule set as well. And maybe it's nice to take a quick look at what these rules entail. Now, this picture kind of shows the basics of the rule set. So there's no mind twist, no Library of Alexandria, no strip mine in this uh, type of old school magic, and only one of, of the lands you see below. So only one Mishra's Factory as well, and one Mace, for example. So these are their rules. Now, if you want to know the specifics of the rules and of how they operate, I believe they've got over 600 members at the moment. Uh, you can check out northernpaladins.com and there you can find the specifics and you can also find out how you can get in touch with them. Speaking about getting in touch, I've also put a link to their Discord in the description below. So there you can find them as well. And every Tuesday they have a gauntlet. So uh, they battle, battle it out under the Paladin flag. So if you're interested in that stuff, check out the description below. Really nice guys. Um, I think they allow everybody on their Discord who's willing to play according to the Paladin Magic rules. And uh, Joseph, please correct me if I'm wrong with this. <laughs> but um, yeah, they're, they're really open to uh, to finding new people to play old school magic with. So um, about today's episode, I'm playing Joseph. He's playing with a deck called Paladin Mountain. It's mono red. And what's really cool, he's playing with fire breathing in this deck. So I'm really excited to show you the deck list. And I'm playing with a deck that I've called Living Lure, and it's a deck uh, built around Living Plane and the card Lure, kind of the combos and synergies between these two cards. It's a completely new brew, a new experiment for me. Now, before I go into the deck text, I would just like to point out that you can always go to the description below. There you find timestamps of the specific deck text, but also of the MTG games. Click on MTG games, and that will take you straight to the games themselves, so you can skip the deck tech section if you want to. Now here we are going to continue uh, with the deck tech and I'm actually going to start with the deck tech of today's guest, Joseph. Let's take a look at his deck, Paladin Mountain. And here we see the deck of my opponent, Joseph. And as you can see, it is a mono red deck. Now there are a few pretty cool choices that Joseph has made that you don't see that often. Um, and I would love to point them out here. The first thing that I notice are the three beautiful Rock of Courageous. Now Rock of Courageous is this alpha creature, right? One red and three to cast for a three, three flyer. I know it's not a vanilla because it has flying, but okay, it's a flying vanilla. Can you say that? But I just love these type of creatures. I'm also a big fan of Phantom Monster. And of course I realize there are better options, right? But from a flavor perspective, especially in this deck, it is just spot on because we also have three Rook X. So Rook X, of course, the card from the Arabian Knight O3 creature. And it is an egg, right? So the bird, the Rock of Kariches, has a nest. In that nest, there are eggs, and those are the Rook eggs. The cool thing is as well, when you read Rook Egg, it says you get a 4-4 bird token, right? So it all makes sense. And it's really beautiful when people try to combine flavor, functionality, all in a deck, you know, and then you get really fun and cool decks. Now, of course, we also see the three Fire Breathings. Now, Fire Breathing a card for one red and enchant creature, and it gives you that Sheevan Dragon effect, right? That if you pay a red, the creature got plus one, plus oh. You don't see enchant creatures often, so again, it's really sweet to see a deck that is playing that. And also, another card I'd like to point out here is Falling Star. So Falling Star, a card from Legends, and you actually need to flip Falling Star, just like a Chaos Orb, uh, but what happens is when it hits, everything it hits, it deals three damage. Now there is an errata uh, telling us how we can sort our, our cards. So what you can do is you can get six cards in total, you can get them together, and then you gotta flip the falling star over it. And you know if it hits, everything it hits, it deals three damage, right? So there is a situation possible with this deck where Joseph has three Rook X on the table, uses one falling star to deal three damage to each, and get four, four flying birds. Now, I mean, I'm looking forward to that. I'm really hoping that something like that will happen. I just think Falling Star, again, incredibly funny card. Now, um, besides these really fun aspects, this deck also has a very serious undertone. Of course, red is known for the direct damage and this deck is packed with it. I mean, we're seeing a full playset of Disintegrate, a full playset of Fireball. I mean, this is business as well. We see 
four Shivan Dragons. And um, what's really nice in this deck is the three Gauntlets of Might. I think they're quite important. So Gauntlet of Might um, is a card from the Alpha Edition. It has not been reprinted in Revised. So this is a, an unlimited copy. Now Gauntlet reads, all red creatures gain plus one, plus one, and all mountains provide an extra red mana when they are tapped, right? So this is ideal for Joseph, also in this matchup against my Mono Green. He doesn't have to worry about giving me any mana. It's not a Mana Flare, it's better than a Mana Flare. And of course you can imagine as soon as Gauntlet hits the board, you know, as soon as he has four mana to cast this, this baby, it's going to be crazy. He can play huge fireballs, huge disintegrates. He can play Sheevan Dragons. Um, he can pump his Dragon Whelps, of course, which are also in this deck. I mean, it's just going to be chaos, mayhem. And I think as soon as Gauntlet of Might hits the board, the chances of then Joseph actually winning that, game, that specific game will have gone up with like 50%. That's like a huge, it's a very important card here for Joseph. So um, another card that I'd like to point out, because what do you need if you want to play a big fireball and basically win the game, right? What do you need for that exactly? You need time. You know, if the deck of the opponent is going too fast, you will never get there. And of course, you've got Gauntlet of Might that can double the lands and can kind of help you get there quicker, but you need a lot of time. So a card that actually gives you time, and maybe you're not thinking about that, but let me tell you, it gives you time, is Diamond Valley. Now, Diamond Valley, a card from the Arabian Nights, a land, you can tap it. It doesn't give you mana. No, you can sacrifice a creature and it gives you life equal to the toughness of the creature. So, um, for example, if I would sacrifice a Rock of Riches, I would gain three life. Now, you might think, why would I? That's a bad exchange, right? But here's the funny thing. You play your creatures out, right? There, there, there are some creatures in this deck. You play your creatures out. Of course, it works great with Rook Egg, of course. You play Rook Egg, you sacrifice to Diamond Valley, you gain three life. At the end of turn, you get a 4-4 flyer. But let's say you've got a Dragon Whelp on the table. Your opponent wants to get rid of the Dragon Whelp, plays some sort of removal. I don't know. Um, he's playing against green, so let's say a Hurricane. In response, uh, Joseph can say, I'm going to sack it to my Diamond Valley and I'm going to gain life. Now, life equals time. The more life you have, you're likely to have a lot of time time on your hands. What do you need time for? To build a huge fireball. So this deck, it's there. It's cool. It's got a flavor part, but it's definitely got a more business side to it. And that is that Diamond Valley buying time, building a huge fireball with Gauntlet of Might win the game. And I think that's a scenario that I'm, I'm expecting is going to happen in one of the games at least. But we'll just have to see, of course. So this is the deck of my opponent, Joseph. Joseph, Thank you very much for uh, for joining us and for bringing this great deck to the table. Now, let's take a look at my brew, Living Lure. And here we see the deck that I am playing with today, and I've called it Living Lure, and that's named after the cards Living Plane and Lure. Both of these cards are, of course, in this deck. Now, this whole deck started with Living Plane because I recently managed to acquire my third Living Plane, and then I said, okay, this is enough. This is the sweet spot. Now I can brew with it. You know, now I can make a deck around this card. So what I've done is um, I've looked at Living Plane and I thought, okay, I want to make a mono green deck because I don't know, I just love mono green decks. I love the idea of walking into a magical forest, right? And you're, you as a green wizard control the whole forest and everything is, is happening in that forest. Now I have to admit what usually happens is I have to put in a lot of artifacts to kind of make it work and to give it that flexibility. You know, when you're playing a mono color, you usually need artifacts to give it an edge, at least in my experience. And what I've done here is I've decided to go for Icy Manipulator and Meek Stone and AO Pile. Now, Meek Stone is an artifact, right? It's a card that says any creature with power greater than two does not untap. So it's a great card against big, beefy creatures. And remember, it's hard for green to remove creatures. So that Meek Stone is kind of ideal to get to kind of contain those bigger creatures. Icy Manipulator helps me because Icy Manipulator taps down the creature. If I've got a Sarah Angel that doesn't tap when it attacks, but with Icy Manipulator, I can tap it when there's a Meek Stone in play. It doesn't untap. It stays down. Another thing is I don't have to take the damage. Imagine my opponent now, Joseph, who plays with four Sheevan Dragon. Having a Sheevan Dragon for one strike, I mean, that can be lethal. If he has enough mountains, I will be dead. It doesn't matter that Sheevan doesn't untap. I'm dead. I'm never gonna, <laughs> we're never gonna see another untap step. 
So um, IC Manipulator is very important there. I tap down a Shivan Dragon, I play a Meek Stone, Shivan doesn't untap, everybody's happy, right? And then let's take a look at the AO Pile. So AO Pile, and this is nice when you're playing with Fallen Empires, AO Pile gives me access to direct damage. That's something that green is really bad at, right? Now, AO Pile, I can sack it, it can deal two damage to any target. So that means that Meek Stone will tap down the bigger creatures, the smaller creatures, like a creature like Preacher, um, a creature like Royal Assassin, you know, small creatures that can be a nuisance, I can kill them with my AO Pile. So AO Pile, Meek Stone, Icy, gives me control, right? That's basically what it does. Now, if we look at the rest of the deck, I'm playing with Living Plane, so obviously I put some thought into that as well. With Living Plane, all the lands in play turn into 1-1 one, one creatures. Now, I'm playing with Tracker. Tracker, a creature from the dark, one green, two, two green tap, and it deals damage equal to its power to target creature, and that creature deals the damage back, right? So when Living Plane is in play, all of a sudden, my tracker becomes a land removal tool. It can start killing land of my opponent. That precious Diamond Valley, it is gone, Joseph. My tracker, it's going to kill it. I'm sorry. At least that's what I'm hoping for, that scenario. Um, and there's even a better plan. I mean, it is a plan, but there's, there's also an A plan. And the A plan is Thicket Basilisk Lure. It's one of the oldest combos in the game, right? You play Lure on Thicket. All the creatures of your opponent have to block Thicket, and Thicket has this unique ability that every creature that has blocked it or is blocked by it dies. So I'm attacking with my Thicket Basilisk with a lure on. I've already played Living Plane. All the untapped mountains that Joseph has will have to block Thicket Basilisk and will die. They will all die. Now, the nice thing about this is that... Um, in uh, Paladin Magic, you do play with Mana Burn. So, for example, if you would try this trick in Swedish, uh, your opponent will say, I'm just going to tap all my lands and nothing will happen. Which is, I, I agree, it's, it's extremely lame, right? But it's your opponent can do that if you're playing that rule set. But now we're playing Paladin Magic uh, and there's Mana Burn. So, hey, you can tap down your land, sure, man. But that means you're going to take tons of damage. So, you know, go ahead. Um... So that is one of the tricks. Now, if we look at the rest of the deck, I think my three silver libraries are very important because they're going to help me to find the components that I need to kind of get that lure, thicket, living plane trick and also to get the Meek Stone Icy synergy going. Okay, so um, this is the deck. This is what I'm bringing to the table. Before I go, one last thing I want to point out. There's a beta Stream of Life in here. I think Stream of Life needs to see more play because it's a beautiful card. And I agree with you, it would be pl more playable if it was an instant. It is not. Get over it. It needs to see more play. So this is the deck that I'm bringing to the table today. Let's go to the games. Game number one. And as you can see, Joseph is sitting on the left. I'm sitting on the right, of course, with the playmat. And look at that custom-made playmat by Joseph. Um, specially made for the Northern Paladins, I believe. And I can see a Nether Shadow and, of course, all the Paladins fighting. And there are some other creatures there. Black Knight, Hypnotic Spectre, Bokrath. Very cool. And you can see those um, uh, Jasper Mirror Force, Demonic Hordes in the back. Of course, a Castle on the Hill there. Frozen Shades. Makes sense. Very, very epic. Anyway, let's uh, let's take a look at the game. It looks like... I'm keeping my hand. Let's see if my opponent Joseph does the same. Yes, he does. It looks like he's on a play here, starting with a basic mountain passing turn. There is a Pendlehaven. Another mountain on the board. Passing turn here. There is a second forest. Well, actually, the first forest, because the other land is a Pendlehaven, but two green now. And okay, this is a perfect start for me. Sylvan Library, turn two. This is what you want to do. I'm on 20. Of course, I have to be careful with trading in life. Uh, am I? Okay, I just thought I was forgetting the Sylvan for a moment there. Um, sometimes it happens, so I'm not really trading in any life here. Probably, I usually do that the first time around. I take an extra card for four life, but now I'm a little bit hesitant because I'm playing against a mono red deck. There's the Diamond Valley. And there is a quick fireball on the trekker. And of course, Joseph can, can play those fireballs quite aggressively because he's playing with four fireballs and four disintegrates. 
And look at that, now I am taking an extra card, paying to four life, dropping to 16 here. Can I put some extra pressure on the board? There's an uh, AO pile from Fallen Empires, the artifact that you can sack to deal two damage to any target. And passing turn here. There is another mountain tapping four. Will we see a dragon weld? No, it is a rook egg. The O3 creature from Arabian Nights. And because he has that Diamond Valley, we can actually sack it to the Diamond Valley, gain some life, and get a 4 4 flyer. Probably going to do that in my end step. Let's see what I can do here. If I can find something. Maybe a Thicket Basilisk having five. There is a Thicket Basilisk. So at least that's something, putting some pressure on the board. But I'm expecting Joseph now to sack his egg. He's actually not doing it interesting. So he's giving me some time here. Instead, he's playing a Gauntlet of Might, attacking out a Rook Egg is now a 1-4 creature. And I decide just to block it. He can sack it anyway to the Diamond Valley. And that's exactly what he does. So he's sacking to the Diamond Valley. That means that he gains for life so interestingly enough it looks like he's only taking three if I'm not mistaken he should gain four maybe forgetting the gauntlet there or maybe I'm making some calculation mistake anyway he's getting a 4-4 flying bird and now I'm attacking of course he's not blocking so I guess he's gonna drop to 21 I'm destroying the gauntlet here that means more life for Joseph because he gets the life equal to the casting cost so that's four more life so he's gonna go up to 24 and oh interesting there is a hurricane that is, that's actually great news for me in the sense that I take care of that 4-4 flyer and I'm pointing it out now to Joseph yeah the 4-4 flyer is dead but it's not great news because I'm playing against a burn deck and I've already dealt eight damage to myself here. So <laughs> that's that's not ideal. Oh, I love this. Fire breathing on the rock of courageous. And this is exactly what Joseph wants to do. And uh, it is beautiful to see both of these cards in action. They hardly see any play. So it's really nice to see these in a deck. Attacking here with the 2-4 thicket, probably just gonna take the damage. And what else can I do? We're playing another AO pile. So that means that I can use both of them to destroy the Rook Egg. Probably going to wait until it is, is his turn. Asking how many cards he has in hand. And I guess I don't want to take the risk. I'm sacking both. In response, he's feeding the Rook Egg to the Diamond Valley. So he's going to gain even more life. And this is a little bit what I talked about um, in the deck tech when I discussed Joseph's deck is that Diamond Valley will give you that life advantage and that means time. I mean, I've attacked him several times and he's still above the 20 life. He's on 21 at the moment. So this is looking really, really bad for me actually. And there is also the Dragon Wealth now and I don't have a lot of flying. Of course, attacking in with the Thicket. I have to say that Thicket is doing a lot of work. It deserves a medal, but hey, he's still on 21. There's an Icy Manipulator. That's actually pretty sweet. That will allow me to tap down the Dragon Whelp. And remember, Dragon Whelp 2-3 Flyer, and for one red, you can give it plus one, plus O. Oh, so you can actually deal a lot of damage with that. And tapping it down now before his combat. And taking my turn. So Joseph here choosing to do nothing, which is, of course, good news for me playing another Forest. Attacking here again with the Thicket, dealing some more damage. Playing a second Thicket, my hand's empty now. But it looks like I've gained some control here. That Icy is just doing a wonderful job keeping that Dragon Whelp tapped. And let's take a look. Still having that Sylvan, of course, but I just don't want to trade in more life. I don't want to drop down below the 10 against a red deck. That's just too risky. Got one card in hand. It looks like I'm doubting. Oh, I'm playing Living Plane, and I think... I think playing Living Plane against a red deck, that is close to suicidal. I have nothing else in hand, so there's no strategy. I guess I'm hoping to, I don't know, just attack next turn with a lot of lands, having the Pendle Haven to pump. I think that's the strategy I have. Anyway, attacking with the Thicket. Oh, Falling Star. Oh, I was afraid of that. 
For some reason, I didn't think about it when I played The Living Plane. Oh, man, this is just stupid. But it's cool because we get to see Falling Star in action, which is nice. Um, Falling Star has an errata, so that means it has a very specific rule, right? You got to flip it just like a Chaos Orb, and you can pick six targets. And you can put the cards any way you want to, but they're not allowed to overlap. So what you can see Joseph doing right now is he's picking six cards. Luckily, he has the two thickets, so he wants to hit my two thickets and four lands. One of the lands is going to be the Pendlehaven. And I think he's pointing it out now, which is which, just to clarify. So beforehand, we knew what was the Pendlehaven out of these lands. And interesting here is that he's picking two Thicket Basilisks. And Thicket Basilisk has a toughness of four, and Falling Star only deals three damage. So maybe he's making a mistake, or maybe he has another burn spell in hand. Anyway, he's going to flip, and what he's hoping for is that he's able to hit six targets with one flip and it's actually possible so it has happened let's take a look i put it in slow-mo so we have time to look at it and here we go Ooh, luckily for me it wasn't a very good flip he's hit one of my lands hopefully it's not the pendle haven so that means i'm gonna lose one of my forests here so forest is gone but of course he put those thickets there for a reason so i wonder what's coming next Tapping three again, and there's another Falling Star. I mean, why did I cast a Living Plane? I was doing okay. Was I winning? Not really, but I was doing okay. Why did I do this? Okay, so he's probably going to take away the Thickets now, I I, I guess. Or, or does he have another trick? Yeah, he's going to take the Thicket Basilisks out. That makes sense, because they've got four Toughness, right? He didn't hit them with the first Falling Star, so... He's going to pick two other forests. Now, again, if he has a good flip, he can destroy my Pendlehaven. He can actually destroy all six forests, and that would be a problem for me. I've got eight forests. I've already lost one. I had nine a moment ago. At least, at least this is a good lesson for me when to play Living Plane and when not to play out Living Plane. And again, he's pointing out, I think uh, the left top is the Pendlehaven. Let's take a look. There is the flip, right? Ooh, he's taking his sweet time. And come on. Ooh, four lands gone with one single card. Oh. Wow, Joseph. Well done. Well done, man. Oh, man. Why did I play Living Plane? Uh, just to clarify, people who are listening to this, I have been playing the game since 1995. And yes, I've been playing it this poorly since 1995, if you have any questions about that. Anyway, uh, well done. It is really cool to have two of these Falling Star flips, um, you know, on the uh, on the channel, by the way. So just look at it from the bright side. But this is going to be very difficult for me. Of course, I can attack now. And that's actually what I'm doing, not attacking with the other thicket. Just attacking with a land and a Thicket Basilisk. I think I should have just attacked with the other Thicket as well. And we see Joseph dropping here to 14. I mean, I still have the Icy Manipulator. I still have some control, but... Yeah, it looks like I'm tapping down to Dragon Ball now. But if Joseph finds... Oh, there's a Fireball. And he's just going to kill all my lands, right? He's just going to kill all my lands. I'm making one land a 2-3 so that it cannot die from the fireball, but again, he's got a really sweet two for one. And he had a four for one earlier with the falling star. So, I mean, this living plane has really kicked me out of this match. Um, the problem is I'm on 12. So all those lands can kind of work against me because because look at the land count of my opponent, Joseph. He's got seven lands. So those are seven, eight, one, one creatures playing a rock of courageous. Man, so he's got eight. 1-1 one, one creatures. Yeah, of course, put a fire breathing on there. It doesn't matter. I mean, if, if, I, if I lose this, which I probably will after playing that living plane, I might as well lose against a rock of courageous with a fire breathing. You know, that is a pretty sweet sight still. And then it's my turn. It looks like, what am I going to tap? Doesn't really matter that much, does it? Actually, tapping is Diamond Valley. That's quite interesting. And let's see what I'm going to draw. So Joseph's on 12 and I'm on 12. 
But I mean, yeah. I think it's pretty much over with those two flyers that Joseph has. And uh, I'm taking my sweet time selecting my cards. It's really a tough spot that I've put myself in. And I can really only blame myself for this. And what else can I do here? Am I going to attack with my two thickets? I can at least attack with one, right? Get him on 10. That's something. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Joseph was saying just... Take take a cheese bowl, man. If you're if you're stressed, take a cheese bowl. But uh, yeah, I'm attacking. And I, and I have to say, Joseph, that uh, falling star flip, the second one, that was brilliant. You hit four lands with a single flip. That is really sweet. And I really enjoy seeing falling star into action. And there's an attack from the thicket. So he's going to drop to ten, passing turn here. And there is another diamond valley. And tapping down, yeah, just tapping down to rock. And there he goes, pumping. Oh, he's going to pump his dragon whelp to the fullest. And that means it's going to die at the end of turn. If you spend more than three red in there, then it destroys itself. But of course, there's another nice combination with, uh, with the Diamond Valley. So before the dragon whelp kind of blows itself up, he's going to sack it to the Diamond Valley and gain some life from it. Going to 13, I want three. And uh, yeah, I'm expecting some direct damage uh, next turn from Joseph. Well, actually, even if he doesn't have any direct damage, he can just attack with all his lands and I'll be a goner. Playing an AO pile here. And passing turn. I think it's, it's oh, this is fun, a desert. You can even kill lands. My lands, if I attack with a desert. But remember, uh, with Living Plane, because they are creatures, your lands have summoning sickness. So that's maybe nice to know. So he cannot use his desert right now. And I'm going to, of course, tap down the Rock of Corriches. And okay, I'm expecting. Yeah, he's just attacking with everything and then he's winning. Yeah, well done. Well done, Joseph. You got this game number one, showing him some cards that I had in hand. Uh, so this was the first game. We're going to dive into our sideboards and I'm going to rethink my strategy. Do not play Living Plane if you don't have a reason to play Living Plane. Do not play Living Plane against a red deck. If you play Living Plane against a red deck, first count to 10. Think about what you want to do with the Living Plane. Anyway, <laughs> this is game one. We're going to dive into our sideboards and we'll catch up uh, with you in game number two. Game number two, and here we go. Well, at least I get to start, right? That's something. And at least I now know, do not play Living Plane if you don't have a clear plan or path to victory because of it. Because playing it against a player who's, who's playing with Mono Red, of course, I didn't know he would be playing with Falling Stars, but the Fireball can also do a lot of work. Anyway, I, I really think I learned from this, uh, from this first game. There's a Pendlehaven passing turn here and a mountain forest. And it looks like another pass. Oh no, it looks like I want to cast something. There's a Sylvan for me and a second mountain for Joseph. And now I'm taking on my turn number three. And at least I'm finding that Sylvan again. That is very useful. Going down to 16, taking an extra card, playing a tracker. And uh, yeah, I think I'm keeping my fingers crossed here because I'm a little bit afraid of a Disintegrator Fireball. There is a third mountain hitting the board. And, oh, interesting, a Granite Gargoyle. That's a 2-2 creature. The interesting thing is for one red, you can give it plus O plus one. So basically, Joseph is offering me a window here to trade my tracker for the Gargoyle. And now the question is, am I going to do that? Trading a 2-2 for a 2-2 Flyer. I mean, the tracker can be handy later in the game, but this is a unique moment for me to kill that Gargoyle. And yeah, exactly, that's what I'm doing. I'm choosing just to kill the Gargoyle. And at least that's something. Ah, Joseph probably has some more creatures in hand. Ooh, there's a Gauntlet of Might. Now remember, every mountain now that Joseph has will give double mana. And also his red creatures gain plus one, plus one. So that means that next turn he will have, if he plays a land, 10 mana. There's a Thicket Basilisk from my side. Let's see what Joseph's going to do with this turn. 10 mana, tapping four mana. There's a Rook Egg. Tapping another four, two lands, four mana. There's a Dragon Whelp. And look at that. 
playing a fire breathing. Wow, and of course using the other mana for his Dragon Ball because this is a format with Mana Burn. So Mana Burn does matter in this format. In the Paladin rule set. Oh, Lure on the Thicket. This is pretty brilliant. Unfortunately, because of that Gauntlet of Might, he, he has enough power to kill my Thicket. But what I'm doing here, I'm trading the Lure and the Thicket Basilisk for Dragon Whelp, a Rook Egg, and a Fire Breathing. So that is a great moment. I mean, I practically would have been dead next turn if I wouldn't have drawn into this. So I'm really, really happy. And because of the gauntlet, you know, I'm going to take four damage. And of course, he's going to get a 4-4 four, four flying bird token at the end of my turn here. There we see there's a 4-4 four, four flyer, which is actually a 5-5, five, five, I believe. Because of that gauntlet of might, there is a diamond valley. Ah, this is looking really good for Joseph. There is a chaos orb. And there is another Granite Gargoyle. Oh my god. Oh, he's actually going to flip. Okay, I think he's going to... He's probably going to flip on the Sylvan, right? I assume it's the Sylvan. Let's hope he's going to miss. Oh, that is a hit. We saw that there in the slow-mo. Oh man, this is looking bad for me. And he's going to attack. I'm going to go to 11. And he's passing turn. Maybe if I have a Hurricane... Oh, this is something. Meek Stone. And oh, this is perfect. What's happening here is Gauntlet of Might is giving all his creatures plus one, plus one, his red creatures. His Gargoyle is a 2 2, so normally the Meek Stone wouldn't matter. But because of the Gauntlet, it's turned into a 3 3, and I tapped it with my IC Manipulator. It doesn't untap. So this is really bad news here for Joseph, and he's going to sack his bird token, so he's going to go to 24. Still has tons of mana, tons of life. I'm not there yet, but at least I'm alive. And maybe I can draw into something here. What can I find? Another forest. And tapping everything. What am I going to play here? Oh, stream of life. That is pretty funny. So I'm going to gain six life from my stream of life. It's really nice to see me play out this card. And I guess the nice thing is if you play Stream of Life with Sylvan Library, basically Stream of Life is almost like a draw spell. Hey, there we see Joseph. <laughs> he really appreciated me playing with the Stream of Life. And that's, yeah, it was, it was really nice. Like we were looking at each other's cards and constantly go like, oh, you're playing that card. It's so cool. Oh, you're playing that card. So yeah, it was a, it was a very nice and friendly game. Uh, and I'd love to play again against you, Joseph. Would be really nice. Um, let's see what he's going to cast now. This is insane. Oh, wow. Look at that. He's pumping his Granite Gargoyle and then sacking it to the Diamond Valley. This is one of his other tricks in his deck. It's a pretty cool deck, actually. So he's putting 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 mana in his Granite Gargoyle. So the Gargoyle turns into a 2, two 14. And, uh, and then he's taking 14 life. And I'm playing a Cockatrice here. But look at the life total here of my opponent. It's insane. I mean, Joseph now has 39 life. Only two cards in hand. Let's hope for me that he can't find any damage, direct damage. I'm still pretty high up in uh, in life count on 17 here. Attacking for two. Playing a Lanower Elves passing turn here. And of course, at Lanower Elves, I can pump it next turn with uh, my Pendlehaven. Actually dealing four damage, but I mean, it's going to take so long. It's going to take so long. And look at that. Tapping a lot again. Uh-oh. Big fireball? Yeah, really big fireball. Oh, he's going to put me on six. Oh, just with one fireball, it puts me on six. I was in the safe zone, and now I'm in the danger zone. I am pretty happy that I didn't overuse my, my Sylvan Library. Dealing four damage here. I'm still alive. But uh, it's going to be very tricky for me. Having one card in hand here, and uh, yeah, Joseph's on 28. Passing turn. Not quite sure why that mountain is tapped, by the way. Oh, I guess I was tapping it with my IC Manipulator just to tap something. Playing another Lanoir Elf, and it looks like he's just drawing Lance right now. Or at least something that he can't use, so that's a good sign for me. Attacking again, and remember, because of the Pendlehaven... I'm now able to deal 5 damage 
every time playing another creature. I'm just trying to dig up all my creatures with my Sylvan. And Joseph is now on 24. He's playing out two creatures, which I'm probably going to tap, but he's play, playing them out just to gain some life. Tapping down the Rock of Corriches, he's going to sack it to the Diamond Valley. He's going to gain three more life, so it's going to take me some more time. He's now on 28. And then I'm going to tap down his Dragon Whelp. He's probably going to sack that then next turn. Looking at what I have in hand, playing a Forest, tapping down the Dragon Whelp, going to swing in here, total for six damage. And he's dropping to 22, almost have him under the 20 mark. But I mean, I'm on six, one burn spell and I'm done for. He's going to gobble up that Dragon Whelp. And <laughs> look at that. Is he really going up to 27? Ah, man. Of course, he's got the Gauntlet. It, it gets extra life because of the Gauntlet. I keep forgetting that plus one, plus one bonus from the Gauntlet here. Attacking yet again, dealing another six. And I need three more turns. He's just finding land so far, so let's hope he doesn't find a burn spell. It seems unlikely, but I mean, who knows? AO pile, that's gonna deal some damage as well. Look at that, he's on 15. Oh, Sheevan Dragon, that's gonna set me back. And this is the power of Diamond Valley. Like Diamond Valley is what's keeping him alive right now. Without the Diamond Valley, he would have been dead already, but now he's on 21. And I have to start all over again. At least I'm able to... Oh, look at that. So I'm using one Pendlehaven, then playing a new Pendlehaven, sacking my old one. That means I can pump two creatures and just basically deal an extra damage, which is actually relevant right now. He's on 14 because I was able to deal seven damage last turn. There is a fire breathing. Oh, and I remember this. We actually talked about this play. What he's doing is he's playing a fire breathing on my cockatrice. And what he wants to do is he wants to make my cockatrice too big so that it doesn't untap. Now, um, our mutual friend, Rich Burke, who is also a judge or used to be a magic judge, explained to us that this play is not possible. So, uh, after the game, actually, Joseph was kind enough to ask Rich about this and send me a message via Messenger and tell me, okay, this play is not possible. So, technically, the cockatrice should untap right now. So, this 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 little trick with the fire breathing is, is not possible. Playing a second AO pile, gonna drop to 10 here. There is another desert. I just feel extremely lucky here that... Um, that Joseph is just not finding anything useful, although the desert can be kind of annoying. So I'm going to attack here for three, and I'm going to pump one, so I'm going to deal four damage, and after damage is dealt, he can kill one of the Lunawars, then I'm going to use both of my Aeopals. He's on two. Is there a hurricane? Yes, hurricane! Hurricane! I can't believe that I won the second game. I mean, I was just extremely lucky uh, yeah, Joseph, man, thanks. He's, he's such a kind guy, but I was just extremely lucky that Joseph only drew lands and creatures. He just couldn't find his uh, direct damage spells there. So uh, that's kind of what kept me alive. But you need a little bit of luck, right? You need a little bit of luck. It's okay. It's okay to win with luck. It's 1-1 right now. That means we're going to get a third game. I'm excited. Let's go to game number three. Game number three. Who will win this epic battle? Will it be mono green or will it be mono red? Joseph versus Timmy. Joseph gets a start here with a desert passing turn. There is a forest into a Lanawar Elves. Pretty good opener for me, actually. I've, I almost forgot I played with four of these. That's basically what you want to have, right? Turn one, Lanawar Elves. And there you go. There I play Sylvan Library again. I'm pretty lucky with the Sylvan Libraries, by the way. Keep finding them. In turn two, so I really can't complain because of the desert. I cannot really attack. And there you go. There are the Rock of Corriches, three-three flyer. That is a bit of a pickle for me here. And taking an extra card, going to sixteen, playing Pendlehaven. That means I can attack. I guess I'm not doing that. Choosing to play out the icy manipulator, and of course I have the mana from the Lanaware Elves to activate it. And actually tap down. Ooh, that is pretty sweet. 
Going to tap down, of course, in response, going to tap down the, um, the Rook Egg. But what I want to say that's pretty sweet, that Chaos Orb for Joseph is probably going to flip on my IC. And, oh, that is a hit. Or maybe the Sylvan. We'll just have to see. What am I going to take away? Yeah, the IC, that makes sense. IC Manipulator. Nice flip, Joseph. Well done. It is fun to play a deck with and Falling Star and Chaos Orb. You just get to flip so often. I just realized that. I've got one Italian Falling Star somewhere. I need to go and look for it. And, uh, well, at least I don't take any damage this turn. That's something. Still on 16. And untapping. Let's take a look. What can I find here? Another Icy would be nice. Well, since I'm going to attack, I guess I don't have it. going to pump it with Pendlehaven. So dealing two damage to Joseph here is going to drop to 18. Oh, this is actually pretty good as well. This is going to keep that Rock of Courage just tapped a Meek Stone. That means that all creatures with power greater than three don't untap. Ooh, there is a big Sheevan Dragon. And of course, it doesn't untap when he attacks, but who cares? It's going to deal tons of damage before that. Remember, he can give it plus one, plus oh of a single red mana. He's got five red mana there. He can make it a 10-5 flyer. So he can deal 10 damage. I will go down to six. Hopefully I can find an Icy Manipulator here. Finding another AO pile. That's not going to do it. I could attack him, of course. Maybe he makes a mistake and taps the Elf, or blocks the Elf, I mean. But I didn't do it. He's going to attack here. Wow, she even attack. That's 10 damage. I'm on 6. Oh, man. If he has a Fireball or a Disintegrate, I'm dead right next turn. What can I do? Don't let it end like this. Play something useful. Tapping six. Okay, stream of life. That's pretty cool. So I gain five life. Choosing not to tap my Lana Elves. That's a strange decision, by the way. Why am I not tapping my Lana Elves again? Anyway, I gained some life. I'm now on 11. And it's unclear to me why I didn't tap the Lana Elves. Oh, there's a Disintegrate on the Lana Elves. And can he actually kill me next turn with one swing? And there's a Cockatrice. Okay, this is perfect news. It's going to keep me alive if he doesn't have a way to get rid of it. Playing a Nevenerals Disc. Okay, blow everything up. That's fine. <laughs> oh, no. There's the Rook Egg. And he's actually going to attack. Of course, I'm going to block it with the Cockatrice. And I'm going to play a Crumble on the Nevenerals Disc. This is getting into an interesting game, turning into an interesting game. I guess that's what I'm trying to say here. He's going to go up in life because of the Crumble to 22. And what am I going to go for? Just passing turn here. Only one card in hand. And I think my opponent, Joseph, is top decking as well. But I'm top decking with the Sylvan. And there's a Mountain. Another forest and playing a Thicket Basilisk. Okay, so what I can do is I can attack and... Oh, there's a Diamond Valley. The thing is, I've got both of those AO piles, so... Uh, yeah, he's going to start eating his creatures now. Look at that. Now he's on 27. Man, those Diamond Valleys are good. Okay, so I'm going to attack. The reason that I attack here is I know that my opponent can block with the Rook Egg. Playing another Thicket. Um, and then he gets a 4-4 Flyer. But I've got two of those AO piles. And for some reason, he's untapping the Rock of Courageous. Yeah, it should remain tapped because of the Meek Stone. He's going to eat it now, gain three more lives. Going to go up to 28. And maybe maybe we get a similar scenario as in Game 2. But remember, in Game 2, I was extremely lucky that Joseph only found land. I, chances are very slim that that's going to happen again. I need some kind of way to accelerate this. Maybe find a Giant Grove. I haven't seen a single Giant Grove. So far, he's still on 24. There is a Dragon Whelp. Probably going to have to kill the Dragon Whelp with the AO piles. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. And look at that. Now he's eating his rock. And get a 4-4 Flyer. 
I'm not really sure why. I thought I used the AO piles against, oh, that is why. Okay, I drew a lure, that makes sense. I'm like, why am I using the AO piles not for the Dragon Wall, but I drew the lure. So that means he's gonna lose both of his creatures and I'm gonna deal two damage to him. So he's on 25, so it's actually looking kind of okay-ish, but I'm looking at the lands. How many lands does he have? He's got four, eight mountains and three deserts. So he can fireball me for 10. Ooh, there's a lightning bolt, so I'm gonna drop. Oh, he's gonna use the lightning bolt and the deserts on my thicket basilisk. Okay, that's pretty interesting. He's gonna kill my thicket. And what's going to happen next here? Finding some more land. This is difficult. And there you go, finding a tracker at least. Oh, okay, there's already a lightning bolt. <laughs> it's hard to play against red, man. <laughs> oh. Let's let's see what else I can find. Another tracker, why not? Why not? Putting some, trying to put some pressure on the table at least. There's a falling star. Oh man, he's flipping so much. So he's gonna flip on my tracker. Yep, that's a hit. Tracker gone, he's just killing everything I play right now. I'm, I'm gonna run out of creatures. Lana or Elf, sure, I've got Pendlehaven. I can still deal two damage. And he's gonna pass turn, so... I'm probably gonna... Oh, I'm not attacking because of the deserts. I'm like, why am I not attacking? He's got three deserts, so he can kill my Lanora Elf, even with the Pendlehaven. And yeah, there's a huge fireball. That's it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess that's the way to go against Redburn. It's just getting a huge fireball. But um, Joseph, thank you so much for the game. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you've definitely built a beautiful deck. Really enjoy seeing Rook Egg and Rock of Kariches in one deck. Seeing the fire breathing in action. Seeing all that sweet falling star. You're really good at, at flipping the cards. Sweet to see. Thank you for this match. And I would also like to thank you, the viewer, for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you want to support the channel, you can do that by leaving a like, leaving a nice, friendly comment. Let me know what you think about the game. And I don't want to talk about Game 2 Living, Living, Play. I, 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 just, I just don't want to talk about it. I'm not ready for it yet. Okay, so do me a favor. Don't mention Game 2. Congratulations, Joseph, on uh, winning this match. Uh, what else you can do, by the way, to support the channel is become a subscriber if you're not a subscriber yet. Um, and also, um, don't use ad blocker. That really helps. Just click the ads away after five seconds, you know, and at least I, I, earn, I earn something from the content that I make. Talking about that, um, you can also become a sponsor of the channel by becoming a patron on Patreon. There's probably a link popping up right now. If you click on it, that will take you to Timmy Talks on Patreon and you can join our Discord, join our tournaments, join, you know, all the stuff that we do. Um, we now have got like 80 patrons, which I'm super blessed. I, I feel happy with that. Don't know why I say blessed, I'm not religious, but anyway, I'm really fortunate. That's the word I'm looking for. I feel fortunate that I have so many supporters. If you want to join, uh, check out the Patreon page. Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at our fantastic, amazing patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazink!